Welcome, everybody. We are glad that you could join us this morning for worship. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do something a little different. A couple weeks ago, we asked you to text in or put pictures of yourself watching the service um, in the comments, and y'all did okay with that. Hopefully, this is a little easier, and it'll be a little, um, we'll have a little more participation. Pick a family uh, in your contact information, a family from church, and just text them, hey, welcome to church this morning. Uh, if they're not here watching right now, they'll feel bad, and maybe they'll jump on. Uh, if they are here, they'll be like, hey, they thought about us. That's awesome. Uh, maybe text two or three, or everybody in the, the church directory. Who knows? It'll be awesome. Uh, so why don't you all do that for us? We're going to take just a second. I'll, I'll let you fill out your card, get your text information put in there, let you all handle it. I'm stalling for time if you can't really tell. Uh, that way you can get all those text messages sent out. And we can worship together. But we are, this has been uh, some of the most interesting, uh, challenging uh, times in my ministry. But I've been encouraged by the things that I'm hearing from you guys, uh, from the things that we've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. And the way we're rethinking and reevaluating some of the things that we do and the way we've reached out and connected to one another. It's really I've uh, been encouraging for us. So why don't we pray together, and then we'll jump into some worship. Father, you are a God that is great and holy, and we love you so much. We're so thankful for everything that you've given us for this day, for the ability to worship together through technology. And we pray that even though we're sitting on our couch or laying in bed or driving down the road or wherever we're doing, that we focus on you, we take this time and make this a sacred moment because everywhere you are is sacred and you are everywhere. But it says where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. You are present, you are worshiping, you are, um, you are with us. You are being worshiped. So Father, make it our homes, make it our bedrooms, make it our porches. Make, they, make them your sanctuary this morning. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the
tell me that you are pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father to you are to you
There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross that narrow sea. There are heights of Thy precious bleeding side. We read, we read yesterday in Psalm 68, verses 4 through 6, and then 19 through 20. Let me read those for you. It says, Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yahweh, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. He brings, he sets the solitary in families and brings out those who are bound into prosperity. This is verse 19. It says, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation. And to God, the Lord belongs escape from death. Our God is the God of salvation. So let us extol his name who rides on the clouds by his name Yahweh who sets the solitary in families. And even though we are spread out and even though we are solitary we are set in a family. The family of God. Jesus died and God covered us with his blood and God adopted us into his family. Co-heirs with Christ. That's what we're celebrating. That's what we're sure of. So let's continue to worship this morning. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God Jesus blessed redeemer sin Blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Thus, who ain't before thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release, near to the heart of God. Where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before thee, near to the heart. Father, that is what we ask this morning, that you draw us near to your heart. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Good morning. We again thank you for tuning in online with us, coming and uh, being with us this morning once again. And here we are a week after Easter and we continue to um, live uh, our lives uh, on the protocol. And, uh, but I do want to give you some uh, encouraging news. We're one week ahead as we were last week. So each week we get a, a few more days ahead of the schedule. And so hopefully for too long, uh, we'll get back to somewhat of a normal life and maybe see each other. But uh, we, we appreciate you tuning in today. And, and for those who are watching us right now, uh, thank you. For those who have slept in and now are watching, thank you for watching as well. So uh, we're glad that you can jump on, whether it's the platform of Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for uh, giving us your attention. I want to continue. We're in the third week of our series talking about the slang word FOMO. And uh, those four letters actually mean uh, the fear of missing out. And when we talk about the fear of missing, missing out, it's usually those words that are used on a social media account. And usually somebody will type that in um, when something's happening and they're not involved. And so when they're not a part of it, sometimes they develop anxiousness or even sometimes uh, depression um, because they're not participating in a certain event. In the first week, we took that word FOMO and we used it in conjunction with the word forgiveness. And we looked at the thought about the fear of missing out on forgiveness. And we saw where Jesus was on the cross and and as he was there in agony, uh, being crucified, Jesus was praying, and, and he's praying these words. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While Jesus is suffering death, he's praying the best for mankind. He's praying the best for you and me. The results of his prayer are seen in the book of Acts, where thousands of people begin to repent and believe in the gospel. For us who are believers, FOMO, the fear of missing out on forgiveness, is also connected with the Lord that we do not forgive as the Lord forgives. We miss out on the uh, ability to be Christ-like. Last week, we took that slang word FOMO in the thought of the fear of missing out on the resurrection. And those who deny the resurrection, well, um, it's the same result as those who do not seek repentance and forgiveness, meaning that there's a life that will spend uh, in hell for eternity. For the believer, if there was no resurrection, then our faith is dead and we are just wasting our time. However, this is not the case, for we believe not only did Jesus come out of the grave to be seen, we believe that he's still alive today. And so today we want to turn our attention back to the book of John, and, and we're going to be looking at what happened several days later when Jesus appeared to the disciples and showed himself. And we're going to pick up the story where one of the 11 disciples was missing. His name, of course, is Thomas. What do we know about this particular disciple? Well, we know that Thomas was one of the 12 um, that was called to follow Jesus. We understand that his surname, Didymus, suggesting that he had a twin, maybe a brother or a sister. We know by Scripture that Thomas takes an active role in following of Christ, often linked with the work of Matthew. But beyond all of that, we know Thomas by a label, a label that has given him the name that has stuck through the years as known as the Doubting Thomas. I, I want to take a moment and, and look at this uh, this morning. And so we're going to look at the book of John in chapter 20 is where we're going to be. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. The Bible says, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, 
Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So I want to take the moment and pray, and uh, then we'll get into our message. Father, we thank you for the moments that you've given us. We thank you, um, Lord, for the opportunity to bring your word. And as we look at this this morning, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray, Lord, that you would watch over us and guide us and help us where we are. And we thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for keeping us safe. We thank you for who you are. We ask that you'd bless this message. May the Holy Spirit speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first thing that we want to do is we want to kind of look at the missing Thomas. There at the very uh, top of verse 24, we discover that Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. And so let's back up a few verses to discover what Thomas was missing. And we could speculate all the possibilities of why he was not with them. And we're not really sure, but we know this, that Thomas was not present with the Lord when he came to visit the disciples. Now, we know that Thomas missed the presence of the Lord according to verse 19 because the Bible says, Then the same day as evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. You can get the opportunity to, to view the Scriptures with your mind. You're going to see this room, maybe with the doors closed and the windows closed, the disciples inside possibly hiding or, or just laying low from all the events that happened. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes through, showing His power, His resurrected body, looking the same as it was before He was crucified but with all the power, all that power, able to walk through doors, to walk through walls. And there we find that Thomas missed that um, power, but he saw that we missed the presence of the Lord. He missed the presence of him standing in the middle of this room with the other disciples. Not only do that, we, we notice in 2 and verse 19 that Thomas missed the peace that was spoken to the disciples. If anybody could use some peace right now, you would think it would be Thomas. You would think that because he's not here, he's going through the same a struggle. He's perplexed about what's going on. And yet he misses the Lord coming in and speaking peace. And, and we know that Thomas missed the proof as well in verse 20. And when he had so, he showed them his hands and his side. So the Lord comes into the room and he, he shows them the proof of who he is, of being, of being crucified and yet resurrected. And here Thomas misses the proof which he's looking for. Then we know that Thomas also missed the praise of celebration. In the same verse 20, there were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord The other two disciples were celebrating. Man, they're just excited of what they have seen. They have been in this room, doors shut, windows shut. The Lord shows up with his power. He's in their presence. He speaks peace to them, and then he gives them the proof of who he is, and they are praising uh, with one another of what they've seen with the Lord and what they've encountered with the Lord. But Thomas missed out. Because Thomas was missing at that moment, he missed the power of the Lord. He missed the presence of the Lord. He missed the peace of the Lord. He missed the proof of the Lord. And we can tell by the celebration of others, well, the thoughts of Thomas. We can see what's happening. He missed it all. He missed the peace. He missed it. So so we see the missing Thomas. And second, we, we see the doubting Thomas. I hope you can see by what Thomas missed caused him to demand the facts about the risen Lord. It seems that Thomas is positive that the disciples are wrong. They're wrong for their joyful noise of the risen Savior. And clearly Thomas does does not doubt his calling. He knows that he was called by the Lord to be a disciple. He knows and he ain't going to doubt his love for the Savior. But he is waiting, he is seeking facts about the resurrection. Thomas, therefore, boldly claims in verse 25, except I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into that print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. You see, Thomas must see the wounds of the Lord, and not only see the scars, but touch uh, the wounds before he believes. 
Thomas had to have sensory proof to believe that Jesus had arisen from the tomb. And everything hinges on the thoughts. If I can see, if I can touch, then I will believe. Thomas is so dug in right here on wanting proof that the words of the ten disciples, the words of the women, their testimony, and even trying to remember back to the words of Christ when he was walking with them on this earth, he has put aside, and they're not going to change his mind. From the small gap that we find within this scripture, Thomas walks away again, missing out on the hopeful presence of the Lord. By denying that he still will not believe unless he sees and touches the wounds of the Lord. So for the next eight days, you would have to think that this whole death and resurrection was weighing on the mind of Thomas. It makes me wonder what he was going through, through his mind those days that people were reporting of the resurrection of the Lord. And, and I would probably highly speculate that Thomas th thought about all those words thought about the words that Christ had spoken while he was on earth and, and thought about the testimony that the ladies had had or, or, or how Peter and the rest of the disciples had said they had seen the Lord. And with that heavy mind, he thought about the crucifixion and, and he thought about how is there a possibility of a resurrection and all that is going through his mind. And then we begin to see, not only did we see the missing Thomas and not only did we see the doubting Thomas, but thirdly, we see the confession of Thomas. You see, on the eighth day, something changed. We read in verse 26, and after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, his door being shut, and he stood in the midst. You see, this time, Thomas is present to experience the power of Christ as he appears before them while the door is locked again. And, and, and while they being shut, the, the presence of the Lord, he is present now to see the Lord. That Thomas is present to, to understand that the Lord had come to, to them once again. And not only that, Thomas now uh, begins to say, and without even saying a word, the Lord comes to him with an invitation. Thomas, do what he said you would do. Go, Thomas, just go ahead. What, what you told the disciples, here's what I want you to do. Thomas, see my wounds and reach out and touch them. The invitation from the Lord. The Lord looks at Thomas and says, be not faithless, but believing. See, Thomas no doubt heard the testimony of all the people, and the disciples and the women, but he did not believe. And the Lord's looking at him. Now the Lord is asking Thomas to believe, not that he has seen, but what he has to believe. In verse 38, Thomas makes that confession. He answered him and said, my Lord and my God. What a strong confession. Thomas is the only one in the scriptures that uses these three words together. And at that moment, every doubt that Thomas had was erased. When Thomas saw the Lord, for here is a man in a confession due to his fault of unbelieving, that the resurrection was possible. The confession of believing the words of Christ that in three days that he would rise. The confession of not believing the witnesses who saw the Lord themselves. And yet, here has the most significant confession of all. In all of that doubt, he has the greatest confession of everyone in the Bible to say, my Lord and my God. Thomas' confession shows that he, can, that he cannot uh, be our Lord unless he is our God. And he cannot be our God unless he is our Lord. They both go together. And so I want to ask you this morning. And you may be watching you may be somebody watching this morning online, doubt that arise in your mind. Maybe you're even doubting the resurrection yourself. Maybe you're, you're doubting your Christian life. There are some doubts have come into your life. You know, the book of John shows us the word believing being written more than the other three Gospels. In other words, John uses the word believe or believe more than the other three. And if you have FOMO, if you have FOMO, the fear of missing out on the presence of the Lord, that could be rectified this morning if you are lost. 
You see, to be rectified, you have to believe in Jesus. Perhaps you're watching this morning and, and you are a follower of Christ. And maybe you have the fear of missing out on the presence of the Lord because there is some doubt standing in your way in your present life. If we were to sift through the Bible on the character flaws of people, I'm going to tell you, you're going to find quite a bit of them. And if people wrote the Bible, if, if people truly wrote the Bible themselves, I guarantee you every person that wrote something in the Bible would have characterized themselves as being perfect. They would have wrote everything good about themselves. But since the Word of God was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it portrays people as well as the disciples as indeed who they are. Flawed. Just like us. Abraham doubted that God would give him a son and heeded the words of his wife to lay with another woman to bear a son. John the Baptist who complained proclaimed Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. Then sent word to ask Jesus, to Jesus, if he was the one to come, or should they look for another? The ladies that went to the tomb with spices to anoint the body of Christ, not expecting Jesus to have risen, they had to remember his words to overcome their doubt while the body of Christ was missing. Peter ran to the tomb, impressed with the words of the women and in the empty grave and the sea and the grave clothes left behind, but still left the tomb wondering what had taken place. Here we are this morning. We're just a group of people with possible doubts in our lives. We may say we have faith to believe, and let me say that's great. But it is a time to ask, is my doubt as a result of missing out on the presence of the Lord? You see, when we have doubts, whether we're lost or saved, these doubts will cause us to miss the power of the Lord in our life. It'll cause us to miss the presence of the Lord in our life. It'll cause us to miss out on His peace. That we'll miss the proof of, of what He's doing in our life. And we'll miss out praising His name. You see, if you're lost, well, those doubts about the resurrection and, and if Jesus is genuine and so forth will get answered or they may never give it answered. You see, you have to be able to go seek the Lord. The Bible says, come and seek me and you will find me. Jesus told Thomas in verse 29, He said, he said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they have not seen and yet have believed. You see, Thomas had to see with his own eyes uh, the Lord and the wounds to believe, but we can't see them physically to believe. You see, we are required to have faith to believe. Faith to believe is something we have never seen, but yet compelled to believe. That's why we come to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what does that belief look like? What does that look like? You see, the priest and the religious leaders believed in God. They even believed in the resurrection of Christ. They had to because they paid the soldiers to lie. Because they, the body was not there. But they still wouldn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that He was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. You see, if you're not a, a follower of Christ, and maybe, maybe today you need to understand that if you're not a follower of Christ and maybe you believe in God, and perhaps you believe in Jesus and you possibly believe in the resurrection, but you have never cast away all those doubts to accept Jesus as your Savior, the one who died for your sins. Why not be like Thomas today and make that great confession? And if you are a follower of Christ, what doubts are allowing you to not acknowledge Jesus as your Lord? And as your God. You know, throughout the book of John, there's, a, there's confessions that, that run through the book of John. And, 
And in the book of John alone, we see these. And one of those, as I mentioned before, was John the Baptist. And chapter 1, verse 24 said that he was the son of God. Nathaniel um, said in chapter 1, verse 49, he's the son of God, the king of Israel. In chapter 4, verse 42, 42 the Samaritans said, this indeed is the Christ, the savior of the uh, world. The man born blind said, if this man was not from God, he could do nothing. And later worshipped him as the son of man. Martha said, thou art the Christ, the son of God. In chapter 11, verse 27. The disciples said, we believe that cometh forth from God. In chapter 16, verse 30. So I want to ask you, what is your confession? What is your confession about Jesus? Can I say, let's not FOMO. Let's not let the fear of missing out on the presence of the Lord. When we can invite the Lord into our lives, if we're lost, we can invite him into our life and spend time in the presence of the Lord and become a saved person. To take that invitation, the Lord is saying, come. And all you have to do is repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And let me end with you, if you're that are lost and you're missing out on his presence. It will be a for a lifetime in hell remembering what you could have experienced. His power, His peace, the proof that He did love you and died for you, and the praise. You see, if you're lost, you're going to miss out on all of those things. And we that are saved and and even though we are saved, you and I could have doubts as well. And when we have doubts in our life, we allow them to interfere with the power of the Lord. We allow them to interfere with His presence in our life. We allow our doubt to um, cloud our peace. We allow um, our, our doubts to try to disprove what Christ is proving in our life. And with those doubts, it's, Hard to praise the Lord. And that's all because we had allowed doubt to overshadow our faith. You know, Jacob had a dream about God. He was about the ladder and angels going back and God at the top. And when he awoke, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. You see, Jacob didn't realize that God was everywhere and did not expect to find God in the midst of his life at that point. Mary, while at the tomb, met a man she thought was the gardener, and the Lord was there so close to her that she didn't even know that he was in her, that he was in her, in his presence until he spoke, his, spoke her name. You see, maybe the Lord is present in our lives. But our doubts have clouded our hearing Him and seeing Him in our lives. Maybe through the doubt, you're not seeing Him presently where you are. Maybe, maybe you're going through trials. Maybe there's some things happening with the protocols. Uh, maybe there's some issues that have developed because of this. And maybe there's some doubts in your life that's clouding your faith at this moment. Maybe, maybe there's some uh, doubt in your life and, and it's clouded your faith, can I say, I believe that the Lord is speaking your name, trying to get your attention to let you know He's closer than you think. Let's don't have a fear of missing out on His presence. Let's give Him our doubts. Let's give Him a confession. We know that He is our Lord and our God. And if you're lost without Him, while we pray this morning, why don't you bow your head and ask the Lord to come into your life. And let us help celebrate that with you. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for the moments that you give us to open up your word today the fear of missing out on your presence. Lord, if there is someone watching that is lost, I pray today would be the day that they would just bow their head, open their heart, speak unto you.
There is no magical words. It's about someone coming to the acknowledgement that they are a sinner before you and ask for forgiveness of sin. And then, as through repentance, will take their life, turn it around, and begin to serve you and to live for you. Lord, maybe today, we that are saved, maybe there's some things happening in our life, those doubts that are clouding our vision, clouding our life, clouding our faith, that we're missing out on the good things of the Lord. May we today bow our head and ask you to help remove those doubts that we may be in your presence, that we might see your power, that, Lord, we can feel your peace, that we could see the proof of you working in our life so that we can praise you. Lord, speak to us. And we thank you for giving us this time to open up your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for online. Um, I pray that we've been an encouragement to you. If you're lost without Jesus and, and today is the day that you accepted the Lord as your Savior, why don't you let us know? Man, we love to be able to um, celebrate with you on that decision. And I hope that you'll tune in again Wednesday as we'll be online once again at 6 o'clock. And uh, don't forget to be looking through your emails and we'll send updates for communication this coming week. Again, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. May the Lord bless you. Have a great day. We love you. We can't wait to see you. And uh, we're looking forward to the day that we all return. God bless you all.